it is, of course, very exciting to be here and amongst many friends. If it weren't for relatives and friends, the audience would be much smaller. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Sheridan, who is a, a brilliant same writer, has asked me to um, but marooned by love in, a, in the United States, uh, has asked me to uh, read a couple of passages, and she was kind enough to mark them. Well, they're both significant because the strains always want to see the big world, don't they? Even if it kills them. And this is one of these two sisters encountering Cairo for the first time. She could barely make a stab at writing letters about Cairo. It overflowed the borders of any possible letter. Here at the railway station, they were loaded by a transport officer four at a time into open gullies, each one driven by a soft-spoken brown man in a tarbouche and wearing a crisp white jacket over a jalabaya. They were carried out in late afternoon into a frenzy of people and traffic a city that was everything. Too many people moving with too many ambitions, too many hopes and destinations. It was at the same time a glimpse of moored river boats on, could it be the Nile? These were officers' clubs, where Nubian waiters in red tarbushes and long white robes glided along with drink, drinks trays held high. Cairo was people carrying all possible items on their heads. A child's coffin, new bought, a lounge chair, a haunch of camel meat, a bed. It was camels and donkeys on pavements and the smell of their urine and men seated by them on mats working with sewing machines or turning furniture, on furniture legs on little lathes. It was car horns of the army and of the rich blaring at one time with the clang of trams and the trumpet blasts of tram conductors. It was street sellers leaning into your gary trying to sell fly swatters and whisks, scarabs and lottery tickets and passing British soldiers telling them darkly to clear out Inchi and leave the ladies alone. It was raucous native bands in unexplained processions, booming and howling, brass and trumpet. And it was shoe shiners crying, hello, George, to the soldiers. And the soldiers with Cockney accents calling, hello, sweetie, at the nurses' garries. Whistles from Australian soldiers wandering the streets like men used to the place, frosted the hubbub with levity. And then the strange sight of the dragoman who could translate a letter into English or Arabic or Greek or French, trudging along with his portable desk, pens and ink, and looking for business without business looking for him. <coughs> Effendis, Egyptian gentlemen in well-cut suits and tarbushes, sat at cafe tables talking at an impossible pace, yet like centres of calm in all the fury. There were acrobats, fire eaters, snake charmers, all yelling out at passing Australian and British soldiers for backsheesh. Shocking beggars, little girls with infants, crippled crones, their hands stained pink and yellow, and every kind of blindness and crookedness of body and amputation, as if these people themselves the were, were the ones who'd taken part in a recent and very savage war. And if you looked at the sky, you saw kites circling above the putrid streets, waiting to descend to their abominable and cleansing meals of flesh. Yet amongst the more talkative women in the gallery, making for their hospital across the city of Atmina, the chatter still a little. I misread that. It should read, even amongst the more talkative women, the chatter still a little. All this just the surface anyhow, the visible part of the grand ocean of life here that you are not equipped to deal with in any way other than by looking at it, if at all, at a tangent. Dear Papa, how can I tell you what Naomi and I have seen? 
The worst uh, injury I ever saw, the one that shocked me considerably uh, in East Africa, was um, faces that were sheared away. And this happened in uh, World War I, too. And uh, there is a character named Constable, whom we follow throughout the book. Uh, the, uh, there's still time to read the yeah. young. Uh, this was, in many regards, a spring of jaunty hopes. Wounded Englishmen strolling General Bridges Street in this big base hospital in Rouen knew what the boomerang-shaped badges on the nurses' go-to-town uniforms meant, and the Gallipoli A for Anzac at their shoulders as well. And English officers stopped them to say, we saw your chaps coming through Armentier to relieve our 12th Division. My heavens, they looked so robust and confident. The influence was more in people's minds, though, than in military dispositions. Not even the greatest Australian patriots could argue that they had the tens of millions, as America did, to make an army so massive that it could be, by mere numbers, tame the year and bring it to peace. Of course, the newer women in the mess believed that each Australian was worth a number of the others, but as Kiernan had said on the Archimedes, flesh was merely flesh. What could not be argued with was the fact that to other armies, the Australians were like the birds of the spring. They were a sign of things turning, of the greater and greater accumulation of armies whose soldiers would resolve it all before the trenches froze again. The Australians were therefore the harbingers. In that atmosphere of newness and hope, Captain Fellows and Staff Nurse Leonora Caseman announced their engagement. But that's another story. I'll go on. Uh, uh, now the first of the Australians began to arrive. One of the young, uh, one was a young officer who had been training in a quiet area they called the nursery. But a shell had found him there, and his entire head was, for the moment, bandaged. The wound beneath that was a test Sally and Honora were set. This scale of harm and outrage numbed and drove from her mind for days on end the memory of her mother and of all connivance with Naomi, her sister. They had collaborated in the mercy killing of their mother. In the surgical ward, since it was considered his wound would need occasional trimming under anaesthetic, the young man took in soup and tea through a tube inserted into his bandages. Other nutrients in sterile solution were infused through a vein in his arm. The ward doctor seemed pessimistic and had declared a face wound a prime site for sepsis. When they first exposed the raw meat of the man's face, by removing the packing place there at the casualty clearing station from which he'd come to Rouen. Sally and Honora found that one eighth of a grain of morphine did not save him agony. Stutters of complaint escaped from the bloodied hole in his face. His one eye seemed to shed tears. So the dose was raised to one quarter, which left him drowsy by the hour and was a good arrangement in Sally's estimation. When so relieved, he could dazedly attempt to speak, making words from the throat and not with his palate. The voice box was intact, but many words were unformed for lack of lips. The name on his labor, label said that he first come in. Sorry, the name on his label when he'd first come in was Captain Alex Constable. This young man, whose face was staked from his upper right eye socket to the corner of his lower mouth, uttered one day after his wound had been dressed an incoherent sound. He repeated it quite politely and insistently. They eventually realized he wanted a pad of paper and it was all at once so obvious he should have been given one and a pencil earlier 
It was as if his lack of a face had somehow prejudiced everyone into thinking he couldn't write. Honora fetched a pencil and a notebook with a strained comfort sponge on its cover. Uh, my father used to send Nazi memorabilia back from North Africa in cake tins with a strained comfort sponge written on them. And that's the equivalent of USO. Um, <laughs> So he gets the notebook, he held up a hand, long-fingered, and had it do a form of salam in thanks. There was humour in his remaining eye, now left uncovered by the dressings. And so he set to writing a letter. The energy and fluency with which he wrote was astounding to Sally. When he was finished, he tore out the pages he had written on and coughed. That was one form of expression thoroughly remaining to him. He folded the letter in four to fit the flimsy envelope they gave him and handed it over for postage. He then wrote on a full unfolded page, nurses, could you kindly send this missive to, and there was an address, Mrs. G.D. Constable, Congungula via Narromine, New South Wales. They said, of course, they'd send it, and he nodded and began writing again. <clears throat> Sorry to hold you young women up, said the page he ultimately handed to them. And then he does something that a lot of people in the novel do. They uh, are suffering with something so massive, they concentrate on one little corner of it to the exclusion of the horror of the whole. Sorry to hold you young women up, but I heard people saying I am the first Australian wounded in France. It's an annoying thing to hear. If you can find the means to do so, could you contradict this silliness at every turn? It's the one thing I cannot stand. To begin with, there were Australians in London in 1914 who enlisted in the British Army. Their cases were written up in the Sydney Morning Herald. Some of them must have been wounded before now. Could you please tell people as kindly as you choose to cut out the rubbish? Yours, Alex Constable.